So good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session of Lepada Leaders. Um, I am just going to, before I introduce our, our guest today, uh, I'll wait a few moments um, just to let everyone gather in from the waiting room. Um, and today we will be talking about why um, Britain is fair. Uh, really in terms of craftsmanship, uh, artisans and the skills and, and the homegrown talent, um, both from today and from uh, a little our sort of recent and uh, past, really. So uh, we have a, a full complement, uh, so we should be able to cover most areas. We've got Henriette von Stockhausen, who is co-founder of VSP Interiors. Um, and uh, Henriette was both at the City of Guild uh, of London Art Studies, at Sotheby's Institute and Interval. So she covers uh, a whole spectrum in terms of both academic and, and design uh, in practice, uh, and also uses antiques a, a lot in her interior. So we'll hear a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, we also have Charlotte Packer, uh, with us, who is editor of Homes and Antiques. So many of you may have come across her in that way. I have as well. She's been a journalist covering this area for a long time. Uh, so also has written for The Independent, The Telegraph, The Sunday Times, um, as well as The Guardian and Tableau, which is a lovely magazine. I wish I actually spoke Dutch, but it's beautifully produced with all of the pictures. Um, and also has just done a, a, an MA in creative writing as well. So I, I don't know if there's something else we should be reading soon. Um, Not but for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have um, Tom... Um, from, who's from Plowden and Smith, and he uh, trained at the prestigious Westine College near Chichester, which is such a joy to visit. Um, and if any of you ever have time to do a course and they do, and you don't want to do a full degree or postgrad degree there, they do wonderful kind of summer schools and stuff where you can actually stay in the college. It's an amazing place. Um, and it's one of the only places where you can still learn your craft, Tom, I believe. I mean, in mm -hmm. certain this country, it's an amazing place. Um, mm -hmm. And yep. Tom has worked on... Uh, some really interesting projects uh, here in the UK and further afield um, for the VNA. Uh, he's worked on Gwynn and Gibbons carvings in St Paul's that we'll hear a bit more about. Um, the Gilbert Scott designed King's College Chapel on the Strand um, and has won some awards as well. So uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, when we start to kind of look at, I mean, it feels a bit sort of in the middle of all of these uh, conversations about vaccines and everything sort of, um, uh, yeah, we're in the middle of a row really aren't we but but here we are and we're able to talk about British craftsmanship and it's perfectly timed um, in terms of sort of one of the pinnacles I think that shows that sort of artisan and skill embodied across different things is it was William Morris's birthday yesterday so um, I think you know timing is perfect for that uh, also um, I think it comes on the sort of the crest of this way which is I think really important actually and work looking at is the government um, have created a big paper on the soft power of Britain being the superpower and I think that where that soft power is is very strong for us um, is actually in design craftsmanship um, and the art market uh, so it's something that we're, we're all part of so uh, it's very good timing and so with that um, I wanted to start with that sort of I suppose slightly thorny, murky issue, and I'm going to start with you, Henriette, on on how Brexit and COVID might have impacted uh, your design projects, for good or bad, and whether that's sort of pushing you towards uh, looking at more British companies as a result. Um, it's it's interesting. I think we we already work with a lot um, of British companies and British artisans anyway because of that kind of niche market that we, you know the sort of country house um interiors sort of market that that we mainly um deal with but um in terms of brexit and um and i guess covid um some interesting things i think um that i've noticed so firstly um we do have problems with um f f fabrics that come from europe italy france um, everything is, you, you can't really be sure um, 
of lead times anymore. Everything is kind of um, delayed. Um, nobody can give you a real idea of when things will clear up or be moved on or um, lots of our items that we had ordered before this um, get held up in customs. They don't know when that will be sorted out. So, so there is quite a lot of um, uncertainty, I think, in that in that respect. Um, the which obviously helps when you then um, when so that you look at more local um, fabrics, of which we have plenty. I mean, so many incredible. Um, you know, new fabric houses and all wallpaper producers, smaller kind of companies, really super creative, um, bringing out new exciting things, new designs. Um, you can really feel a, a proper vibe, a proper buzz, I think, going on in, in, in our design community, um, which is exciting and kind of the the kind of other side of the coin of COVID, I think, people sort of look more inwards and also probably creativity has been hugely pushed by sort of having the time and being at home and, and, and having the ability to maybe, you know, create a bit more and, and also think about our homes more. So those, those I think, are the, the major things that I have noticed um, in the past year or so. And actually just taking that uh, a little bit further, that idea of this sort of um, uh, incubator, if you like, for British talent. Uh, Charlotte, are you seeing that as well coming through editorially in terms of um, wallpapers and fabrics? Yes, and absolutely. I mean, every not a day goes by without us receiving a flurry of press releases and samples that relate to, you know, really beautiful and exciting new wallpapers. Um, made in small batches by small designers. It, it feels like it's actually quite an exciting time. And although I think things have been really hard for a lot of businesses that, you know, orders have been canceled, sales are limited. Some people have talked to us about the fact that that pause has allowed for a different kind of creativity to do, you know, without deadlines, without the, the pressure of supplying particular people at particular times designers have been able to perhaps sidestep and um and i've noticed there's a ceramics artist polly fern who is an illustrator and suddenly she's really been exploring wallpapers and i i don't know i haven't asked her whether that is as a result of all of this but it has absolutely come out of her works have appeared during this kind of covid year and um, yes, I mean, it, it, it feels like there's, there's a lot of really exciting things happening, which is, which is great, really. And I think there's an appetite for it with our readers who certainly have been saying to us when we've begun to focus on these things, um, thank God, colour, pattern, joyful things. That's what, that's what they want to see. We've, we've been stuck at home feeling frustrated and bored and anxious too. You know, our homes are both a a prison and a, and a haven but it is that one little area that we can exert a little bit of control over and so it doesn't surprise me to hear from Henriette that there is a lot of activity there people being interested in wanting to do things to their homes so it's potentially a really exciting moment I think. I think I, I think that's really it, it's interesting we've talked quite a lot about that sort of being around your four walls and looking at needing to zone and you might do that with a desk or a tapestry or something like that but actually what we haven't really explored is that element of out of control outside and that sort of need to, to control inside although well, still out of control so I'm, I mean, I'm with you I've been waiting for some fabric for my sofa for quite a long time <laughs> still on order um before we move on to the next question, uh, what I what I hadn't uh, mentioned this time is, of course, there will be time for questions and answers for anyone who, who's joining us. And if you just pop those into the Q&A box and you'll see, um, I think Gillian, my colleague in marketing, has already put up um, our speaker's websites and will continue to put in material uh, in the chat function um, for references and things as we go along. But, just sort of, I'm wondering as well um, on that, just thinking about this kind of new surge in creative talent. Um, for you, Tom, do you see um, particular skill sets that, that we are good at? Because obviously you have within your workshops, you've got a, a whole workshop of people coming and, 
I know that you did have quite a few people coming from maybe across Europe to learn the trade with you. Is that something that will continue? And and is that because West Dean College is here and Plowden Smith is here, or is it just the particular skill sets that that Britain has that can teach other people from your workshops? Yeah, I, I think I think we we've always um, encouraged interns from abroad to come um, and spend time in our workshops, and I think hopefully that will still still continue. Um, it, it hasn't really been possible um, th this year, obviously part of last year, potentially due to COVID. Um, I, I, I don't think Brexit will will stop that happening, and it's it's something we we encourage really as well. Um, I think yes, definitely the UK is still seen as leaders in lot lots of different craft areas, and um, we can certainly um, assist with the experience um, that we can we can give to to, to interns and students um, from from other countries, um, mainly mainly Europe. Um, but yeah, yeah so it's so. And sort of continuing this idea of people being kind of locked in their homes and obviously they're looking at design projects and everything, but have you seen as well, I mean, you know, presumably many of the dealers who normally put things into your workshops um, are able to give you a lot more time now because they're not rushing to have something maybe for the next masterpiece, which sadly has been postponed again. But have you actually seen people, um, the private members of the public come to you? They, they... Yeah, no, 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 very much so. Um, I, I think as people are spending more time in their homes, um, you know, just even the general wear and tear on their furniture is is more. So, you know, the the, the chairs are the joints in the chairs are becoming looser quicker. I think, <laughs> and also people working from home and you know the the desk that they've had in their their office that probably barely got used before they're now actually sitting at and using and realizing the drawers don't work properly or the, the handles come off the third drawer or and it's just something they've never perhaps had time or it hasn't annoyed them sufficiently to have anything done but now obviously they're they're, they're using it more and and um and deciding it's a good time to get it repaired so yeah we we have had things that are definitely <laughs> Um, come from people spending more time at home and and as uh, as we say you know people are looking at stuff more because they're they're in their homes more so um all those little little jobs that they've been putting off perhaps or haven't irritated them sufficiently and now that, that they want done so um yeah we, we've had we've had as well wonder whether and it's something that that um we see at La Parda and you know generally particularly in the art and antiques area is everything has a story and it's come from somewhere and it's going somewhere perhaps there's also a sentimentality or a relationship we can't develop our relationship with with people in quite the same way that maybe there's some sentimentality developing around things that we were i don't know less careful with in the past i wonder if, if covid is something that's impacted that i can see him yet you're nodding so perhaps you want to add <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I no, do. I, think I do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Carry you on. Go, carry on. You yeah. No, no. Carry on. Carry on. No, you go first. Oh. Um, I was just going to say that I think over over this time, um, people's uh, people have changed. Also, the way that they look at um, you know their furniture and and maybe consider more um, where things come from and and you know I'm hopeful that. Um, you know, we can change this sort of throwaway culture and that people actually, yeah, pay more importance to provenance and, and where actual things come from and how they're made. And, and, and that way, you know, give something another lease of life, use, use more antiques. They're incredibly well made. They have a story to tell. They come with an instant patina, with a sense of past, with a you know, with a sense of maybe belonging. A story that then becomes yours, and and somehow that gives you know an interior, an interior, a, an extra sort of comfort. I I think, and and I think over this time, and that we've sort of been stuck at home. 
um, people have started really caring more and, and whether that's where their food comes from, of course, that's the same and, and, and maybe going more local shopping, you know, all of those things, but the, the consideration then goes on to furniture and how things are made and what things are made out of and what are we doing with our, you know, it's a huge subject, but what are we doing with our byproducts? What are we doing about wool? What are we, you know, um, I, I think people have just in general become much more aware and interested um, in, in that sort of side of things. And, and that's a really good, good thing. I don't know if you see that too. Tom, but um, it's certainly something I have noticed hugely. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing I was going to say actually is that we, we talk a lot about, or people talk about sustainability and recycling, but obviously reusing is much better than recycle. And what is reused more than anything? Um, something that has stood the test of time and is part of the uh, art of antiques and certainly something that is restored. Um, I just want, I know we've got a, quite an interesting project to talk to us about, just thinking about sustainability um, in terms of Devon. But before we move on to that, I wanted to sort of pick out some maybe some particular uh, projects and, and sort of um, that are indicative of British craftsmanship. And I just wondered if you could talk us through, given that this year is the tercentenary of um, Grinlin Gibbon, so it's sort of a great craftsman. Um, Tom, I wanted if you could just talk us through that project that you got involved with. Yeah, no, the, 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 the project I was involved in was, was actually several years ago, but we were um, involved in um, conserving the organ case at St Paul's, um, which was um, installed, I think, in about 1690 um, by, by Grinling Gibbons. Um, Grinling Gibbons came over to the UK from, from Holland. He had um, English parents but um, he came over just shortly after the great fire um, of London and uh, initially he started um, doing carvings for ships I think actually um, and then then moved on to more architectural work um, and yeah we, we were asked to come and look at the carvings at St Paul's uh, that that cover the the organ case um, there was a lot of loose elements um, and, and, and a lot of dust that needed removing. Um, so it was a it was a sort of a true conservation job. We didn't actually recarve or replicate any of his carvings, but um, we, we put we made sure none, none were loose and were going to fall off. Also, we had <laughs> quite a considerable amount of carvings that had already come off that we had to find positions for um, you know f find where it had come from um, which um, if anybody's seen the organ case it's it's quite a task to actually pinpoint um, <laughs> where any piece of carving might have come from um, it's not, not always obvious that there's actually anything missing um, unless you're up close to it as well so this is it's made in limewood isn't it yes no that's right lime, limewood was was used for its you know, it's a very tight grained wood but but also very very easy to carve um compared to something like oak you know you can the detail that you can achieve on it is much crisper and sharper um, um it's it undercuts very well so you can make the, the carvings look very light and and and, and very fine um, it's an amazing timber to use um that you got to work on it and that is i did read something the other day that the when the fire happened in hampton court that it was an american who ended up restoring that and he's written a book on it which um I was yes yeah no I, I i i can't think of his name now but um yeah, yeah. he's almost yeah, yeah. be coming yeah. to us but if you're not seeing anything coming to the workshops that you're having to get ready for the exhibitions this year because I know that there's going to be some exhibitions later. Yes, no, there, there, there will be. I mean, the Grin and Gibbon Society are obviously going to have a a lot. There's a lot, lots of things going on there um, for the August centenary. Yes, um, so, so but worth worth watching. <laughs> So um, when we were, I'm just thinking about sort of British talent and everything. And when we were kind of having a conversation before Charlotte, um, you talked about porcelain and something. And I just wonder if this is something distinct about the sort of UK story in terms of, yes. if you like. But and how we're seen. Yeah. In a sense. Just a little bit to that. Then we can explore yeah. it maybe 
relevant. Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it's very it's very difficult for us to sort of see ourselves, isn't it? And in a way, it, it's one of our um, one of our writers, um, Willa Latham, who has a fantastic website called The Gentle Rattle of China, and she specialises in British porcelain. And she um, she's uh, Dutch, half Dutch, half American. And you would think that her interest would, might be in Delftware and uh, Dutch Dutch um, ceramics, but actually she's obsessed with British porcelain. When she moved to the UK, she became completely fascinated by it. And um, she said the thing that excites her so much about it, or, or she sort of under, understood the excitement of it in terms of um, it's an industry that was never owned by royalty. It was never owned by government. It was always in the hands of private um, individuals, entrepreneurs, people who were hugely competitive um, and hugely creative. And that sort of intense competition then gave birth to this extraordinary variety of porcelain that has kind of continued in a way that I think is unrivaled in terms of its, its range and variety. And, um, and people are very, very excited about it all over the world. And she has customers sort of globally um, who she sells her, her porcelain to. And that, that really kind of gave me pause because I think we're often quite outward looking, which perhaps is the source of our creativity in that we, we are a bit of a melting pot. Our language reflects that, you know, we, we've, we borrow words from other countries. We absorb all of this stuff, but, but kind of repurpose it in a, in a, in a slightly unexpected way. And, um, and I think that's, that's, yes, I think that's really sort of rather wonderful. And we also have great art schools as well in, that support all of this. So, so yes, that's, um, yes, it's, it's interesting to see how we're seen. And I know Henriette experiences this with American clients as well, who see that there's a real sort of cachet with um, British made products and whether they're antiques or, or contemporary crafts. So, um, yeah, oh, Henriette's disappeared, I think. Yeah. Oh, I think I'm back, I'm back, sorry. Fantastic, okay. I say, yeah, that, thank you so much for, for seamlessly leading us to Henriette, Shella. <laughs> your American project, but also I'd quite like to explore a bit about your Devon project as well. So, um, so yeah, start with the kind of outward facing, so. Okay. Um, just, just, I think, um, in terms of the, um, so we've got a couple of American projects, um, and I think this um, comes about because of exactly what um, Charlotte was saying. I think we've got such a, a plethora, I mean, so, so many amazing um, artisans and suppliers and furniture makers and, you know, um, stonemasons and, um, you know, uh, fabric wool producers, um, you know, we make for, as she says, for so many other countries, you know, for example, our, our, there's, a, there's a company called Johnson's of Elgin up in Scotland who make the most wonderful uh, wool and cashmere fabrics um, to deliver all over the world, really. And they, you know, they're, they're, they're producing for MS, for example, which, you know, nobody would know, but that is the case. And, and I think that's the case for so many other companies as well in the UK um, that quietly, you know, um, export. And so we've, so with our American clients, we, um, they really value um, all those things. And so we're loading up con containers full of um, beautiful, beautiful um, antiques. Um, and for example, um, sort of specialist upholstery, um, things we, you know, Howard um, sofas, uh, armchairs. There's another company um, called Ensemble, which make really um, beautiful handmade traditional upholstery methods, horsehair, and so on. Still, all all the old ways, um, and and there's lots of those. Um, so I think the Americans really value that as well as just the British look. So um, I think they really care about that. So, um, for example, we in that container goes a, a few pieces from Soen, Britain, which probably everyone knows, um, you know, some, some brass etagères and things like that. Um, exquisite craftsmanship. Um, 
which which also um you know they can't get so you know that's what they really want so that's so that's the sort of beginnings of the of of uh, american jobs um which you know will take a long time because it, it takes quite a while to fill up a you know a big container of really interesting things um but so then um going on to our devon project um this was a re particularly interesting project because um the brief was really to restore completely restore this beautiful beautiful old um Reg regency house um pretty much it, it you know it needed pretty much everything doing and so um that meant that the, the, the client didn't want anything um in the house that wasn't original or antique or of the same period or had provenance or you know so so it was a real sort of jigsaw puzzle of where to get the right thing so as an example um we needed some floorboards where some were rotten and things so um they wouldn't just go and um let us get some you know some of us something similar it had to actually come from the um from this from Devon so it had to come from the neighboring um areas so we we then in the end found um, with the help of this amazing builder um we found some old floorboards of a of an old nunnery um not far away um that um got reclaimed and the house the nunnery was of the same age so so really that was kind of to the extreme and but but that then also moved on to every element in that house was antique so from the bathtubs um to the vanity you know the stone vanity units to um we even had an antique um loo a blue and white china loo um that water monopoly sourced um which was called the gladiator and and it took us um, at least half a year to source um, original old flagstones for parts in the hall that needed patching up um, that had been cut out for various things. So um, it was a, just a particularly interesting project um, in that respect. So for example, that four poster bed that you're seeing is um, an antique one and of the period and something that you would have found. So, and, and the fireplaces all, it, it had um, kind of new fireplaces in from the previous owners. So what we did was, um, you know, find what would have been there and find the actual antique pieces and and put it all back as to how it would have been. And underneath this huge rug, you can probably hardly see, but is are the floorboards from the nunnery. Um, <laughs> so that that sort of thing. But that level of um, you know of research and detail and and thing, I see much more. On projects these days, people are much, much keener to to actually find original pieces. Um, you know, even even for kitchens, they love this sort of story that comes with it. Um, so, in the kitchen in that project, for example, all the fittings were. Um, Oh, that I get to the wallpaper in one second. There's a the, the all the fittings are antique and old. So there's some swan neck, some swan taps with an actual face of a swan um, sink taps, which you know took forever to find, but are just so special. And um, that gives that house a real character and a real feeling and a story to tell, and 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 just add something interesting everywhere. And kind of to wrap it all up together, you have to find that that missing piece, which which is not possible, for example, to be antique. So that wallpaper, um, which kind of melts it all together or, or, or webs it all together and makes it work, um, is from an amazing British um, designer called Martha Armitage. Um, right. who, I who I believe is a, is a sort of third cousin of the of, of, of the Queen. Anyway, she's an amazing um, artist, and she block prints those those very very special um, wallpapers, which you can customize the color, the you, you know everything. And because they're hand 
printed, block printed, they have that real antique feel to them where nothing is quite, you know, lined up. And, and so um, it just looks like it's, it's sort of meant to be then as it sort of evolved over time. And, and that is really what, what we're trying to achieve and what we're, you know, what we're all about. Um, that, that's comfortable kind of interior that looks like it's sort of slightly evolved over time and with different you know um inputs maybe and and sources and 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 sort of collected pieces rather than something that has just happened in a in a quick flurry um although even if it maybe it has but you know it, it doesn't want to look like that and yes. and I think that is what people are after much more these days, and especially the Americans um, now, really, you know, love to create that that look. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, from an app, I'd love to have a proper look and step inside, but I mean, it looks, you know, incredibly um, smart and and wonderful, but also actually just very warm and comfortable. It looks like a home. Um, that you would want to, to be in. But I, I just, I, I'm just thinking in terms of sort of that, sort of that's, you know, reclamation in action, if you like. And Tom, when you're um, sourcing things for a project uh, and you're doing restoration, where are you, are you having to sort of reclaim pieces to be able to fit with the restoration you're doing? How do you source Yeah, your... I, I mean, it, it, is, it is very important to use timbers of the same quality and age uh, and it, it, we tend to be sort of you know put, putting a small patch on a on a piece of furniture which you know to try and match grain yeah. on, on wood is it can be quite complicated and, and and difficult to actually get just the right piece but obviously the the better the match the better the job so um that that is a, a big part of our work really to uh, be able to we have we have quite a, a large stock of um, what we would describe as breakers, which are, are pieces of furniture that perhaps are, weren't worth restoring or gone beyond the uh, point of being restored, um, which we're able to source well, spare parts from, if you like, you know, so we can use a, an original drawer bottom if we need to replace a drawer bottom in a chest of drawers, we, you know, we have the right thin material, if it's, you know, might be a nice piece of quarter sawn oak, which already has the, the amazing colour of a piece of 18th century oak on it, so we're not having to apply additional colours or stains, and also we can, we would also use pieces of wood that also have a finish on it and already have the patination of age on it so we're not actually having to replicate 300 years of patination we're actually using a piece of timber that's of that age almost that that has the patination of age already on it um so yeah that's <laughs> you know the, the best the best piece of conservation or restoration of a piece of furniture is 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 finding the right piece of timber to to, to patch or repair it with um because yes you can you know you can apply color you can apply finish um to to um to, to, to blend the repair in but it's it's always better if you don't have to to mess with what, it too much what, um, who's the holy grail to work on what now, what's just so beautifully made that it's just a total joy are there kind of designers makers or class stand out that well i i think i think perhaps for, for me it's maybe more more of a period that i like working on and and also from the sort of point of view of satisfaction as well it, it's nice to have something that look comes in that looks a real mess and then you actually really pull it all together and it looks amazing um you know I, i'd sooner be working on something that is a, a real mess that you can have the satisfaction of it actually looking amazing after you finished it um but but for me you know sort of 18th century mahogany pieces or or, or the, the walnut period is just that, that's what I like but but also I, I really like sort of very regionally made pieces um, you, you know that have an amazing patina um, on them. Which, it's, uh, I, 
thing that draws everything together, isn't it? So whether it's the wallpaper that you that brought the kitchen together, whether it's the pattern on a piece of furniture, it's those textures and colours and warmth that that draws it together. But no, um, no. Just thinking about the sort of back to that controlling your environment and the impact of COVID, people obviously use homes and antiques as a fantastic, uh, an educational tool, but also a fantastic mm -hmm. reference and sourcing tool. Have you seen particular trends sort of over the last few months or, or that you're sort of looking at, in fact, what, whatever you're writing mm -hmm. on now, your projection um, in few months, what, where things are going? Well, I think, I think actually that, that it seems that um, we were sort of worried at first because there was this awful lull where suddenly all of the things that we had planned for the magazine slightly fell by the wayside because we couldn't shoot things. There were all sorts of problems. Um, but actually our readers' appetite for um, learning about antiques, reading about antiques, but also much more reading about seeing antiques integrated within interiors, interiors it is very much homes and antiques it's you know we don't live in museums um i think the interesting thing about henriette's design for for their house in devon is that it's those it's that layering you have some contemporary pieces in there but they're sympathetic and so you have this sense of a of an interior that, that, as she said, has sort of evolved over time. And I think those are the interiors that people are increasingly interested in. It's not those kind of starry, aspirational interiors. Mm -hmm. It's ones that, that really feel like they are an, a personal expression of, of the owner um, and that it's been thoughtfully put together, sometimes with exceptional and really um, museum quality pieces. But other times it's things that they've just acquired over time, they've fallen in love with the thing, it appeals to them for whatever reason. Um, and slowly they've built a room around these pieces. Um, and it comes back to that idea of the stories within them. I think anybody who's interested in antiques is, is fundamentally, it's about the stories they hold, isn't it? And it will either be the story of the piece because how it's made, what it represents historically, or it might be that it belonged to a particular person of note. And so somehow you're able to connect with that person through that piece. You know, they read this book, they sat at this table, um, or it's perhaps your family. And I think in this experience of COVID, some of those little pieces that we might have that are really of not very great financial value, but they have huge sentimental value, which has really grown um, in that this is the closest I'm going to get to my mother, my sister, my aunt, whoever. And, um, and so there's a kind of renewed appreciation for those things and that these are things you do need to take care of. And actually, they're preferable to the brand new teapot that you might buy wherever. This one is a bit chipped, but it does work and I love it. Um, so I sort of feel like there's, there's, there's a real... Um, appetite for that actually at, at all at all levels which is which is really lovely because it means that then the stories we're pursuing are much more about makers and the people behind all of these things which I think is yes there's that moment isn't there on the antiques roadshow where it's like but what's it worth but equally a lot of the people are there because genuinely they sort of say at the end oh thank you so much for letting me share this with um with the viewers. And, and I do think that is a genuine um, desire that people have to sort of connect through these things. And, yeah. and I think actually it, that sort of touches on um, what's exciting for craftsmen and women of today is that they are, there's an equivalence there as well, that when you commission a piece from a maker, there's another story that begins there that you talk to them about their work, they talk to you about what you want from them. They they might have an interesting history as well about how they came to be doing what they're doing. There's a, there's a really interesting chair maker, Jason Mossery, who was originally a tattoo artist and he did a one day course making a Win Windsor chairs and that changed the course of his life. And he now makes these really beautiful chairs that are absolutely in the spirit of that tradition but they are also, they're contemporary, but in a really subtle and exciting way. And somebody will buy that piece. And so that cycle of the story begins again, which I think is really nice. And, and that's something we're covering quite a lot with, we have a, a strand in the magazine, which is about heirlooms of the future, which is essentially that idea of 
who who's the not quite the chip and dale of today but you know the, the 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 piece that you might buy now that your grandchildren will be very grateful to you for having <laughs> invested and taken the time and, in, and engaged with a craftsperson I think actually just thinking about that sort of commission as well and that relationship and the dialogue with you have with someone who's a maker is an amazing thing and that is something that I've really noticed um, with the sort of with social media just growing and growing that actually you can reach out to some very small independent uh, makers who are it's you know quite often unbelievably good value who are developing their career that you you can develop through even Instagram and direct messaging a, a relationship where you can build something to commission but I'm gonna take that as one of your nominees Charlotte so that's your, oh, your okay yes future and then um I'm just going to ask each of you maybe for a sort of a, a, an icon of sort of British design or craftsmanship from um, yesteryears and from today. So I'm going to start with you, Tom, who um, who's the sort of the British star, if you like, in terms of designing <laughs> and making. Well, I, I suppose de de definitely from the past, it would have to be uh, Thomas Chippendale um, for, for for making furniture. That's perhaps quite quite an easy one to say, but uh, he's he's by far the most the most famous and um, and, and very rightly so as well. Um, yeah, and so um, very influential because of the the book and I mean it was sort of a whole marketing exercise exactly well. yeah his, his directory yes was um co copied by 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 lots after <laughs> as well um but um he, he certainly set and, set the groundwork so after and is that to... the, the proportion the design is it because he brought something different to what was going on at the time what is it that I mean you know of course there's a directory but what was it that set him apart at the very beginning well I, I think it was the design as well and and, and the quality and the, and the materials he was sourcing at the time um, were just yeah f phenomenal you know the quality of the mahoganies he was using were just 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 amazing I mean he had yeah um, so bits of his yeah. language in the breakout room or the break room in the so, sorry bits of <laughs> languishing in your breakages run no, uh, unfortunately <laughs> i don't think we have any uh, chippendale pieces in there <laughs> yes, think, no no we, we, we wouldn't certainly be breaking one of those anyway <laughs> if we did but <laughs> are there craftsmen sort of working now that you think are going to really build a legacy or or um uh, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Um, I, I think perhaps, yeah. I mean, like I say, it, it's been it's been heavily copied his style, um, and perhaps in some 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 places it has been copied very well. Um, I think where you can always spot the copies is quite often with the quality of the materials that that are available to use as well. Um, so. Um, that, that that can certainly be, be be how you can how you can tell the, from the, the the real thing to the to the recently so made. Um, luckily, we've got people like you, and also lots of experts fetching that for us as well. Yes, no, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting people have, have made them as 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 fakes, but um, you no, know, we'll we'll just um, um, so. Just um, Henriette, I know you work with so many different and um, craftsmen. And one thing that I think is quite interesting, and most people I think watching today actually are from our sort of our fair database. But I know some members will watch this and and um, watch it when it goes onto the YouTube and shared with members as well. But how do you source your antiques? What what can our members do to attract you for your next Devon project? You, you keep breaking up, but I think oh, I got sorry. what you asked. It. How do I source my antiques? Yeah, and, so, and, and, so, and so, um, yeah. I mean, not just, just to say, I mean, not everything has to be antiques. As you pointed out, you know, it's really exciting to commission something from, yeah. from, you know, new craftsmen because it then makes it truly uniquely yours. So, and it tells, starts telling your story, which is, 
super exciting. So um, whilst I love antiques and I couldn't ever imagine a room without antiques or even God forbid living in one, th that doesn't exist for me. But um, I think there is, you know, it needs to be a balance, I think of, of you know, antiques um, and new things because somehow otherwise, I, I think they help each other. So if, if that balance is reached, but so in terms of sourcing antiques, there is so many um, different ways these days. There's so many channels that help with that. So there's kind of the collective websites, um, decorative collective and the sale room to comment, so on and so forth. Millions of them where you can, you know, they make it very easy. You just put um, what you're looking for in a search bar at the top and suddenly, you know, the whole of Europe's all suppliers um, are at your doorstep. And, and then there are things like first dibs, which even include, you know, the rest of the world. So nothing is not achievable or reachable or findable, I guess. And so that's, that's quite interesting. And that's more of a recent thing. Previously, you'd had to look quite far and wide to, to find the special piece. Now that has been made much easier. Also, there's a lot of really great auction houses, local or slightly bigger, um, not just, you know, your, your big ones that um, have actually got really um, superb stock. Um, and again, to go back to antique pieces, not every piece needs to be museum quality. Every, every piece has got something that's desirable about it. And, um, you know, and every person has, or is looking for a different, maybe look, feel, color, warmth, you know, and that's what's so exciting about antiques because there's so many different styles and, uh, and types. And so, so you can find your own preference, um, but you can also, there's also lots of little antique shops still you know, if you go to London, I mean, you know, uh, m millions of little areas where you, you know, whether that's the Lots Road or whether that's, you know, Pimlico Green, where everybody is now, you, you, you go and you've got one after the other that's better than the next. And, and they're all slightly different or specialise in different things, but it, it's certainly somewhere where you can go and spend a day and find whatever you're looking for. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's, and, oh, and there's so many options. I'm going to give a little shout out to our Le Pas de Marketplace website as well. But yeah, absolutely. Yes, you're right. absolutely. I think that still, you know, places like Ken Church Street, Broadway, Harrogate, there are still kind of groupings that are natural homes to go to yeah. um, in, in, you know, Kent, the Cotswolds, all sorts of places. But um, so you've talked about some crafts. Um, people i know that you're a particularly uh a fan of uh lulu light i think but are there so in terms of sort of uh stars of the past and the future give me give me two names that you think are particularly so yes i do love lulu little um who um i was going to talk about her return book a little bit because we touched on it earlier because it's such an interesting you know and, and sort of niche market material um so and she has got a really a, a fantastic eye for um you know taking things from the past and making them you know approachable and and relevant for you know today's market and what people like to have in their houses today um, whether that's rattan or there, she's got specialist metal workers and or fabrics that are all printed in the UK. You know, she she's certainly um, someone that that I hugely ad admire for that uh, and her incredible creativity. Um, someone else that I think has got that balance just perfectly spot on in terms of antiques and comfortable feeling interiors is is Robert Keim, obviously one of the greats. Um, you know and when you look at his book that he's written, I mean, you know, the, the, the amount of incredible um, homes, you know, I don't know if you can, if it's an insult to call them homes, but they are homes because they're so yeah. livable. You know, they're obviously hugely important houses, but um, to, to be able to create that comfort 
in a stately home, you know, where everything is scaled up and, and quite impressive is something that I think not many people can, um, can achieve. Um, so I, you know, I'm one of the best. And, and then in terms of looking backwards, I mean, I'm, there's so many, but I guess if we're looking, you know, Britain um, would probably have to be David Hicks. Um, I get, I mean, you know, he put English interiors onto the scene, I think, pretty much. So, but also at the same time, he was, um, you know, a pioneer in so many things. And he, he sort of, you know, whether that was in carpets or in furniture design or in color, in fabrics. And I mean, he, he was like all encompassing, you know, in every single element. Um, of interior design, I think um, that you know I have to choose him because there's there's no one really quite like him out there, and so he he was sort of the pioneer for this great um, British interior design kind of industry that we have that everybody kind of really looks at. I think. Yeah, I, I and I've heard that from quite a few people at Interpol mm. as well. Completely. He set the tone. And Charlotte, what about you coming last but not from least? From the past. Um, yes, a, I, you can have one, another one because you have. Um, well, actually, I've, I've got I've got two two Eleanors, in fact. Oh, because I, okay. I an Eleanor, Eleanor Code, because I just mm. sort of thought she's so extraordinary. And I'm sort of fascinated by her story, about which I don't really know that much. But I just, you know, she... I think it was her parents went bankrupt. So she ended up moving to London and then she bought a failing factory. She improved the recipe for um, artificial stone, saw off all the competition. And um, I think she, you know, she produced things for George III, she Brighton Pavilion, all sorts of really important houses of the time would have garden statuary made of code stone, architectural details. I mean, and they survive today and many of them in pretty pristine condition. And she guarded that recipe. Um, and I think it's only in recent years been rediscovered, hasn't it? And Code Limited has been reformed. But I just feel she sort of embodies, although there's a question mark about how much she designed um, the actual things. I mean, she's described variously as a sculptor, but I think she had a lot of really brilliant sculptors working for her. So she sort of supported all of these people. Um, I think she kind of embodies that on, entrepreneurial spirit and daring and um, that, that a lot of uh, craftspeople need today in the current climate. You know, she sort of withstood quite a lot of, of troubles. And um, I only recently learned that her old, the factory actually sits underneath the Royal Festival Hall, which feels rather fitting, yeah. but yeah. this this kind of amazing thing that is a, a concrete <laughs> uh, building that one of the earliest, one, I think it was one of the first uh, post-war buildings to get a, um, a, a grade a, a list, to be listed. Listing. And underneath it is Eleanor Code's, was Eleanor Code's factory. Uh, so I think she's a fascinating person. I'd like to know more about her. And um, the other Eleanor is um, a woman called Eleanor Lakelin, who we recently profiled. And she began her career as a furniture maker, but was increasingly frustrated by the fact that she was always carving off the bits of the wood that she found most interesting, the, the kind of burrs and the, the lumps and, mm. Um, and so she then got into wood turning and sculpting, and she makes these extraordinary vessels uh, from wood. And they look like they're made of porcelain, and they are beautiful, beautiful sculptural objects. And she has been commissioned, her public commissions always are about place. And so recently, I think during lockdown, um, she was commissioned by Reading Jail or Reading Museums to produce um, a piece about Reading Jail. And it was sort of interesting. She was having to produce it in lockdown, basically jailed herself. Um, and it's to commemorate um, Oscar Wilde, the, the jail's most famous resident. And it's called, I think 
think it's called Oh Beautiful, Oh Beautiful World, which apparently is what he said on, on the day that he stepped out of the jail. And it's made, it's two beautiful urns, I suppose, made from the, uh, the wood from a, an avenue of chestnuts, that horse chestnuts that grew outside the jail and they were diseased and they needed to be chopped down. But uh, Oscar Wilde would have seen those trees on entering oh. jail, mm. seen them on the... And she has made these beautiful, beautiful urns. And I just think there's something, she sort of embodies actually, I suppose the, the, that idea of story, of place, of connectedness that we've been talking about and, and her objects are the kind of beautiful decorative pieces that, do they have a purpose? I don't know, they just love I think, I think we've put, for anyone who's watching, I think in the chat, we've just put a link to it and I'm going to have oh. a look, that's absolutely yes. wonderful you. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any questions. Gillian, do we have any questions before we close for today? Um, I have a yeah, bit we have on my phone. <laughs> um, we have one that says, what do you see um, the role of sustainability or how do you see the role of sustainability in this renewed interest in British um, or local craftsmanship and design? I think we might start with Henriette for that and then we can move quickly before we Okay, I think um, sort of sustainability is hugely important, um, obviously, but um, I, th I think it, what's most important is that we all have to kind of change, change our um, ways a little bit and our outlook um, and it, think about how we use think things and why we use them. Um, because for example, you know, uh, wool, is you know something that you know we could use much much more and it is a side product which is there and you know we should we should think about um you know that and and this is just an example but we should think about it for insulation we should should use more wool covers we should use it in in many different ways and and that kind of then goes back to sustainability, but also to choice. And it is a choice that we have to make before that can actually then um, move on. So it's, it's back to us, I think, where we really have to be more conscious of what we use, how we use it and why um, as a consumer. Um, to really make some progress there. But I think it is one of the most important things that we really have to, we have to address like now. So yeah, very important. Thank you. And presumably for Tom, I mean, sustainability is at the core of everything you do because you're exactly, yeah. and reusing. Mm -hmm. but, but do you have to be quite careful about some of the materials you're using in terms of um, maybe the glues and 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 then how you actually move things around or, or do you have those um, conversations in? Well, I mean, most of the adhesives we use are, are natural products as well. So um, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, <laughs> all, all pretty sustainable really. Um, and I guess that the fact that we're, yes, re reusing a lot of timber sourced from um, existing pieces of furniture um, that we have that we use as breakers is um, also a very good good way of um, re reusing materials. Um, so I guess yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, obviously the, the the shipping of pieces and um, moving them around is 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 one thing but that's yeah. ine inevitable <laughs> it has to come to our workshop quite often to, to be repaired so um yeah um that's that's one, um, one, one. just very quickly before um tom we've had another one asking about uh, having antique pieces and and that are sentimental rather than financial balance but value how do i balance the restoration costs when the value is limited well, well that 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 is always very difficult because uh, you know to 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 you know re-glue a chair if it's worth five thousand pounds or fifty pounds the, the hours that it takes is quite often the same and that's mm -hmm. that that's where it becomes comes very difficult um and and we're also quite often dealing with something that's it's an object that's being used i.e sat on or the drawers need to be able to be opened you know because furniture does tend to be used and not just 
something that sits on the mantelpiece that you don't have to worry about too much or, or touch um, regularly. Um, it, it's, it's a very difficult one um, to, 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 you know, to, to give somebody a, a better price just because it's not worth much. Um, <laughs> and and there, there's not, to that. There, there are shortcuts that can be taken, but it's not always the best way to, to, to restore something and, and, and not necessarily something we'd want to yeah. do either. Um, just, just and that's... Sorry, apologies, Tom. It just we, I can see that time is marching on. We're about yeah. to finish. Just interested from Charlotte, before I sort of close and say thank you, are you seeing, um, because obviously Henriette can, can both choose through her own company and through her clients to, to sort of help educate and make people make the right choices but within the sort of the magazine and and the uh letters and the things that come on are you seeing a general kind of um conscientious and a movement towards wanting to be more sustainable and i guess i'm thinking also of a younger audience who may be uh, enjoy antiques from two reasons one is the sustainability element and story and the other is actually um moving away from that sort of cookie cutter approach that that is the sort of ikea and and the things that they would have quite exposed to recently <laughs> absolutely you know people people really are i think very when when the the houses that we write about people always talk about their antiques very much in terms of that they would always invariably prefer to buy an older thing it's it's part of that sort of second hand culture they're happy to do that it isn't an mm. issue and it, it's I, th I think it, it's there for them as a kind of conscious thing perhaps when they're ordering certain things if they're working with craftspeople it's nice to support local people that air miles thing that used to be a thing you'd collect and now you really want them to be you know it's it's a thing you want to avoid so there's definitely that people do talk to us about that but i think if you if you are interested in antiques and that's what you're buying in a way it's it's sort of secondary perhaps because you're you're already doing that thing if you yeah. sort of, that makes sense i'm not putting it terribly well but um yeah. I think I think you're absolutely right, and it's something that I I think the antiques world has been slow to own that actually yes. we've always been sustainable. But actually, I like Henriette's point about the wool and things like that. I mean, fantastic packing materials. You know, it also works when you're having you know you're able and cold delivery, and it, it's a way of insulating. But actually, there are a whole load of ways that we also, can make shifting and movement of art and antiques. I antique. was going to say um wool. I was Sorry. quite wool is quite an interesting thing because there's a company called Natural Mat who make who make mattresses and bedding. Yeah, they're great. Um, and yeah, they they make these wool duvets, and I am going to get myself a wool duvet. I'd never hadn't yeah. sort of come across the idea before, but it sounds wonderful, and it's from a flock of sheep that they know, and I kind of really love that idea of of it being this. Yeah local thing you know they they do the these their mattresses are also fully organic you know that's it? why they're called it natural it's it's quiet and you know and breathable and and you know and sustainable yeah and absolutely. so really really important but but i do think there's a great trend towards this in every sector i think people yeah. and actually my i noticed it in my children they're yeah. much more aware even though they're only 10 and 13 they want to know where things come from they don't want to you know they, they yeah. are very much on that um save our planet um drive so they're super conscious and i think there's a whole generation coming up that you know really want to look after the environment yeah. and you know so yeah thank goodness thank goodness we've got yes. we've got behind us saving the day thank you <laughs> yeah. thank you so so much for, to all of you for your time thank today you. henriette and charlotte oh, thank you thank you, thank um, you. So to Cultural Comms for helping us put this together and for Gillian uh, powering it away in the background. Um, and sorry if there was any glitches, I was having some IT problems, but uh, thank you. Um, and uh, we will see you anon in a month's time doing another Lepard Leaders. Right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.